Yes. And got it. Excellent. And OK. So yes, welcome, everybody, to our big data uh, week five, so actually our sixth week of big data, talking more about uh, SQL this week. And as a reminder, your first SQL homework uh, due tonight at midnight. Um, lots of people have said that it was much easier and more fun than the, the previous homeworks, which is uh, good. You'll have a lot more homeworks in that style of homework. Uh, and uh, very few, probably no more homeworks that I can think of right now that are more in the style of the, the flask on Docker where there's all sorts of uh, problems that can go off, go wrong and you're just uh, fighting error messages the whole time. Uh, today in class, we're going to, uh, well, as a reminder, on Thursday, you have your first SQL quiz. So we'll finish going over the material for that SQL quiz. And there's also two handouts up here up front uh, that have material for your next week's quiz, which we will probably start going over today as well. Uh, uh, before going over technical stuff, though, some just short announcements about grades. All of your uh, anything that's been submitted has been uh, graded, and so you should all check and make sure that uh, the the grades are things that you. Uh, agree with that I haven't made any mistakes. Um, the, the Twitter coronavirus grades look roughly like this. Lot of uh, really great grades. For uh, people who got points docked, it was uh, about half the case where the uh, just something about the numbers that you were reporting were totally off the wall and not correct. And then about half the points were for some sort of presentation issue about things like the uh, uh, axes being unreadable or something like that. And uh, so you definitely always need to be in the habit whenever you're presenting graphs to people of making sure those graphs are actually readable and people know what, uh, uh, what those things are graphs of. But overall, really good scores here. Let's make sure we're adding everybody to the room. And then the Flask on Docker, also uh, lots of really good uh, scores here, especially on this one. And this was a really uh, hard assignment, but uh, lots and lots of people got everything working to the point of getting your animated GIF uh, showing how to upload things. Uh, people who missed a couple points, uh, usually uh, uh, just uh, something missing a couple files or something very, very small wrong. Uh, and overall, course grade distributions look looking pretty good at this point. Um, but again, if you, for whatever reason, are not happy with what your grade currently looks like, there are lots of extra credit opportunities. And I've just posted this morning a new extra credit opportunity related to Docker. So if you are one of the people who really liked the Flask on Docker assignment and you want to do more of that kind of stuff, um, here's up to eight extra credit points that you can do with that. There's uh, a handful of tutorials related to this cool talk called Docker Swarm. Docker Swarm is something that builds off Docker Compose in order to uh, get your, your containers actually onto a cloud environment. And if you follow this tutorial right here, use Docker Swarm to deploy to this uh, cloud called DigitalOcean, which is a uh, famously much cheaper than Amazon. So it's a one that a lot of uh, sort of young startups are, are going with these days, uh, then you'll get some extra credit points and they offer you uh, students uh, uh, money to play around with on their systems. So uh, that would be a, a cool thing, possibly fun to do. Also good to like show off on resumes or talk about when doing interviews. Another opportunity is there's this tool called Kubernetes. Kubernetes is like uh, Docker Swarm and Docker Compose, but even more so. Uh, it is the uh, it was developed by Google, and it's their main tool for how they run all of their infrastructure. So you can imagine that if it is uh, uh, something that Google uses to do all of the things that Google has to do, then it has to support a lot of complicated edge cases. So Kubernetes is famous for being uh, uh, significantly more complicated than Docker Compose. Um, uh, there's a tutorial right here for you can build an Amazon clone. The the, the website that you would build is actually like uh, significantly like Amazon, uh, you can actually 
buy and list books and things. So even more like Amazon than your Instagram clone was like Instagram. Uh, and if you do that, you can get two points of extra credit and two more points of extra credit for actually deploying to a cloud somewhere. I think this, uh, this meme right here kind of summarizes how people feel about uh, Docker. So like the, the small brain, Docker, comp Docker by itself, then Docker Compose, then Docker Swarm, and then Kubernetes is the, the tool for the people with the, the huge brain explosion brain. Any questions about anything administrative in this class before we get into technical stuff this morning? OK. Everybody's ready for some fun SQL problems? Yeah. Um, so we're in our week two uh, SQL folder right here. Actually, OK, a few more quick announcements. Last announcement here. Um, strongly recommend you like get a good workflow going for all of these assignments. Um, so part of the assignment is actually completing it and passing all the test cases. But maybe an even more important part of it is just like being comfortable in the terminal and Vim and using all of these uh, tools together, actually properly being uh, lazy while you are programming. So here's a nice quote by Bill Gates that I like. I will always choose a lazy person to do a difficult job because a lazy person will find an easy way to do it. So you should be finding easy ways to uh, work on these assignments. You might not have heard of Larry Wall before, but he's another famous uh, programmer. Uh, he invented uh, uh, the Perl language, which was sort of like the Python before Python. Um, lots of web pages in the 90s based on Perl. And so his uh, three chief virtues of a programmer are laziness, impatience, and hubris. And so you should cultivate those uh, attitudes in yourself if you want to be a, a great programmer. OK. Technical things. We're going to talk about, uh, again, on Thursday of this week, next class period, you have your first SQL quiz in, uh, in this class. And it's based off of the material here in this SQL quiz repository. And uh, so last time, oops, and up here I'm not in the right branch. Let's go to the master branch. Last time, we talked about this createTables.sql file. And uh, we started talking about this quiz example one and this quiz notes one. And we will finish talking about those next. That your quiz on Thursday is going to be off of material inside of this quiz notes one. And the format of it will be like the format of this quiz example one.sql file right here. This example one.sql file, this is actually last year's uh, exactly what their quiz was. So um, yeah, your quiz this year will be, be very similar to this, just four different uh, problems that I will make up the morning of the quiz. Again, the, the format of this quiz, you will not have any sort of electronics available to you. So it'll be the same sort of rules as the, the previous quizzes on the shell, you will have to, uh, in your head or manually, pencil and paper, figure out what all of these queries are going to do based on the create tables.sql file. And I'll give you a, a handout that, or a printout of this create tables.sql file on Thursday as well. So you don't have to have like exactly memorized what's going on. You can reference exactly what are the column names, what are the different rows inside of the table, and, and so on. And then for each quiz problem, what you have to do is you have to draw the table that is the output of that quiz problem. And again, I don't care about the, the column names because those are going to be uh, uh, yeah, they're sort of unimportant. What I care about is the actual values of the, uh, the rows. And uh, for each problem, uh, if there's a difference between what SQLite and Postgres would output for that problem, you will have to tell me, show me the output from both databases. And if there's no difference, you can just draw it once and uh, tell me that they're the same. Uh, OK. I'm going to switch over to the terminal next, coming over here. And I'm inside of this SQL quiz folder. Uh, we're going to take a look at uh, this uh, quiz notes onesql file, which is, again, uh, something that we started going over last week. The handout's up front 
are this quiznotes2.sql file and the quizexample2.sql file. And we will uh, probably get to, uh, by the end of today, starting to go over these. But these will not be on the quiz on Thursday. Only the quiznotes1 material will be on the quiz on Thursday. Last time when we first started talking about the quiz material, we saw two different ways that you could uh, access the uh, 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 the quiz, either through SQLite or through Postgres, that's uh, down, I'll do it down in this terminal down here, if you did SQLite 3, and then uh, we have this quiz db.file, and I will let people into the waiting room first. If you do SQLite 3 and then the quiz.db file, then you're inside of SQLite, and you could run some uh, commands. I'll go ahead and open up this quiz example one dot sequel vim quiz underscore example one dot sequel like this. And I'll scroll down over here to that first problem right here and paste that in. And uh, so the output here is uh, zero for this problem. And so if you wrote, if you were to write zero, you'd get full credit. If you were to write anything else, then you would not get full credit. In this case, there is no uh, I like operator or like operator, and so we would expect the output to be the same in both SQLite and Postgres. We'll go ahead and verify that real quick. I'll press Control D right here to leave the SQLite 3 environment. I'll do Docker PS to check to see if um, the, the container is running. I can see right here that the container is running. Um, if it was not, I would have to do Docker Compose up D first to bring it up. But since it's already running, I can go straight to Docker Compose exec pg psql like this, and then copy and paste this line right here. And we get the, the same exact answer down here for the zero. And again, for the purposes of the quiz, I don't care what you call your, um, your columns. I don't care if you even draw it as columns. What I care about is the actual uh, number down here that is the contents of the rows. Any questions on any of that sort of setup information? Yes, Avizer. Yeah, so the question is, so in, uh, we'll, we'll just go over this whole, whole problem right here. Uh, there's a number of interesting things about this problem. In general, when I'm working on any of these uh, quiz problems, uh, so if, for example, if you're reviewing in your, um, your packet or working in the quiz, uh, rather than doing like the whole problem at once, I find it easier to just start by thinking about the column list as just a star. Like we'll start by selecting everything from uh, the, the table over here, and we'll also start without any where clause at all. So I could do that. And this just shows me what the contents of that basket A table is. And it's basket A because that's what's to the right of the from clause over here. Again, on the quiz, you'll have access to the create tables.sql file. And so you can actually look at the, uh, for example, this insert statement right here, so see what are the things that are being inserted into basket A. And you can, so manually verifying this right now, this table right here exactly corresponds to these uh, rows that have been inserted on these, uh, from this command right here. In both Postgres and uh, SQLite, by default, null values are displayed as just uh, empty uh, empty locations, and so that is a fine thing to do on your quiz, or if you wanted, you could just write the, uh, the word null as well. Either way would be fine. Um, but here, I'll, uh, this is again my always starting point every time I'm thinking about a problem. Just think about, first of all, what does select star from basket A, or whatever the table is that I'm looking at, what does that do? And then the next thing that I will uh, look at is the where clause, whatever filtering is going to happen on this uh, basket A table. And in this case, the where clause is this where ID is greater than null. And uh, the, so the original question is, I'm confused about what uh, this null operator is doing and how it interacts with things. Well, anytime you have a uh, operator over here. So here we have the greater than operator, or it could be the equals op operator, or any operator at all. 
if, uh, if you have an operator and a null value, then the entirety of this expression over here will evaluate to null. So here, the ID greater than null. The right-hand side is always going to be equal to null, so it doesn't even matter what this ID is ever going to be equal to. I can just immediately decide that this entire expression is equivalent to null like this. So ID greater than null, always equivalent to just null because one of the uh, inputs to the operator is null. When you have a where clause, uh, the null value is interpreted the same way as a false value would be. So here we're selecting everything from basket A where this condition over here is true. This condition over here is never true though. And so when I hit enter, we'll see that we get zero rows out as a result. If I were to change this to true, then it would always be true. So we would get all the rows as a, out as a result. If I said something like ID equals three, then it would only be true at this one exact row right here. On some rows like this row right here or this row right here where the ID is equal to null, then the ID will get substituted with null. We'll have null equals three and the whole thing will evaluate to null again. And uh, so that's why those rows are not included. Um, but anytime you have null over here on the right or the left-hand side of an operator, doesn't matter. The entire operator expression will evaluate to null and where interprets null sort of the same way as false. It's basically not true. And so it doesn't select any of these columns over here. Uh, so after thinking about the where clause, the next thing to do is to think about what the actual like columns are that are being selected. And in this case, it's a count distinct count distinct ID like this. And in this case, it doesn't matter what we're counting over here because there's nothing to count. So no matter what we included in those parentheses, we would always get a zero because there is nothing to count. So in this case, the answer is zero, both in SQLite and in Postgres because of the null behavior over here. For this first quiz especially, uh, understanding null is the most important thing and most people will lose most people who do lose points lose most of their points because of not understanding how the null is interacting with everything. Uh, after this first quiz, all of the subsequent quizzes will uh, just basically be assuming the, uh, that you have an intuition about how this null operator is going to be using. And uh, so, for example, on future quizzes, we'll be doing things called outer joins, left-right joins, and those uh, behave weirdly based on the null operators. And so there's no way that you can possibly do uh, get those quiz problems right if you don't understand the null for this for this first quiz. Question. Um, the question is, should you think of null as a value? Um, so, so technically null is a value, but uh, uh, it, its semantics is that the whole operation will be interpreted as false. When a null has to be uh, uh, typecast into a Boolean, when this thing over here will evaluate to null and it gets typecast into a Boolean to evaluate the where, it'll get uh, evaluated uh, to, be, to be false. And again, the, um, uh, the, uh, the behavior of null is exactly the same, same null behavior exactly the same as none behavior in Python. Um, so if you're familiar with Python uh, and all the weirdities, oddities that go along with none, uh, null has the same behavior. Actually, uh, Python adopted the behavior of none based on how um, null operates in SQL. The semantics of null, which I think is sort of getting at what the original question is, like how should we think about null? Is this like a missing value? Does it represent a missing value? Does it represent that like there is a value there but we don't know it? Does it represent there is a value there and the value is actually null? Uh, that all depends on how people are creating their database and people do use null for all sorts of different purposes like missing data or, um, or uh, like there is data that's there, it just happens to be null data. Uh, uh, the semantics, people use, use null semantically in many different ways, uh, but for the purposes of the quizzes, uh, you should try to like not think about semantics at all. Like the homework uh, is where semantics, like the meaning of why you do something, that's the homework is about that. Uh, the, the quizzes, you should just think about like the mechanics of how things work and not the why behind 
why things work the way they do. And so here, just uh, evaluate it mechanically and, um, uh, and, and so this whole thing mechanically evaluates to null and then that causes the where to always or to never get true. And so we never uh, select any of the rows here. One of the maybe yeah side notes uh, about like the sort of philosophy that I have about these quizzes is that uh, a lot of students try to get by on SQL thinking about the semantics of things and understanding like this is how I think things should behave and uh, in the vast majority of real world situations if you follow that you will probably get very reasonable results um, but the quizzes are designed to not take semantics into account at all, just force you to think about only the mechanics and force you to think about the weird edge cases um, uh, where just following your intuition is not going to be helpful. Why is that? Well, it turns out that many people who use SQL, especially not with computer science training, so a lot of people in like the economics department use SQL and do things incorrectly. And economists in particular are famous for having like uh, making uh, statements about the economy and then a computer scientist will dig into the SQL that they used and realize that the SQL does not correspond, does not do what they thought it was doing. And so their statements about the economy are 100% false or totally backwards from what they, they thought they were saying. Um, so the, the purposes of these quizzes is really to help you understand these mechanics so you don't make those same mistakes of an economist and do things that uh, are, end up being incorrect. Uh, hopefully that answered the question somewhere in that rant. Any other questions so far? Reason. The question is, uh, what if we had a string equal to null? So something, I'll go ahead and uh, since we're in Postgres right now, it's perfectly okay for me to, I'll just modify this table a little bit, modify this database, and after I modify it, I'll bring it down and bring it back up to get me back to a clean state. And so I'll insert some uh, new data into this uh, basket A. So insert into basket A. ID comma fruit values one comma null something like this uh, not fruit but fruit underscore a and now if I do a select star from basket a like this we can see that we do have a this null string inside of here but the null string is not equal to the null value so if I do something like select null equals no, these two things are not equal to each other um, or not equivalent to each other. So recall, first of all, that anytime you're doing a comparison with null, you probably want to use the is to actually compare to null. Um, so this says this is not null. This, uh, the null string is, in fact, a string value. It is not the null value in the same way that in like Python, for example, Python, the string none is totally different, totally different thing than the none value by itself. Uh, so the string null, totally different than the, the value null. Okay, since I modified this table, let's go ahead and docker compose down, docker compose up. Oh, and I'll press control C because I need to do it with the dash D flag. Control R, P SQL, bring that back up, and let's do a select star from basket A. Just verify that that null string is not in there anymore. Oh, yeah, all great questions so far. Uh, next, I'm going to open up the quiz notes underscore one. And let's remind ourselves what we've talked about so far. We talked about the aggregate functions like the count and uh, the sum. There are many aggregate functions in uh, Postgres and, and SQL in general. Uh, for the quiz, though, uh, only the count and sum are things that are reasonable to do in your head. So those are the only ones that will be on the quiz. Talked about how distinct works, making uh, that it counts only distinct things. 
Um, then this, we had this big discussion on null values. Again, this is the most likely way or will be the uh, most, uh, most points that get lost will be lost because of these null values. So make sure you understand uh, this set of problems here. And then we talked about last time the like operator and in Postgres that like is case sensitive. I like the I over here stands for insensitive. And so I like is case insensitive. And that this is how the, uh, the ANSI SQL standard uh, is requiring databases to behave. Uh, SQLite though, due to backwards compatibility reasons, uh, uh, is stuck with like being case insensitive. And um, so SQLite 3 here, not ANSI compatible, does not follow the SQL standard, and will have different behavior than Postgres. And at this point, this is the only thing that's different between these two databases uh, in terms of what they can do or what they do do. And for this first quiz, if there is no like or I like operator anywhere in the problem, then you know the output between Postgres and SQLite will be exactly the same. There might be a difference if you have one of these two operators, but there's not guaranteed to be a difference if you have one of these operators. Um, in your, your homework, uh, you've used this, uh, this group by a lot, uh, also with uh, some of the first labs. And then, uh, so we've seen the where clause, the difference between where and having is that where happens before the grouping and aggregation, having happens after the grouping and aggregation. Uh, so we're not gonna cover this uh, in detail right now, um, but probably uh, you'll have a problem on the quiz that involves this having clause with a group by clause, and you'll have to understand what's going on with that. What we're gonna do in class, focus on today, is these joins. These joins are one of the trickiest concepts in SQL. It's really what makes SQL powerful and what makes SQL very different from other languages, other programming languages. And so we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about these joins. Those of you who have uh, done SQL before, you probably from your previous instructor only had maybe like a week or two of, of SQL. And so they gave you like a really quick introduction to joins, getting you like maybe some high level intuition about the semantic use cases of when you might want to use the joins, but they probably totally glossed over the actual mechanics of what's going on with these join operations. And in order to really understand complicated joins, which you will need for the quizzes and your future homework assignments, you are going to uh, really need to understand like at a low level what these joins are actually doing. So we'll spend a lot of time in class uh, today and the next couple of class periods talking about these joins in detail. Uh, okay, any questions about where we're at before we get started on new stuff today? Okay, so the first type of join, the most basic, most fundamental type of join that we will talk about is called a cross join. Uh, and this is one that is not normally covered in like the foundations of data science courses. Semantic or syntactically, the way you do a cross join is in the from clause, you have two baskets listed or two tables listed over here. In this case, I have basket A, then a comma and basket B. And this comma indicates that we're doing a cross join between basket A and basket B. I'm going to run this uh, query and then we will talk about why we get the results we do and explain what the cross join is. First of all though, in order to run this query, so again, um, I have my Vim window open up here and I'm trying to copy and paste, but I have these line numbers over here. And so commonly when I'm working inside of SQL, wanting to copy and paste things from the top down into my bottom PSQL environment down here, I'll do colon set no number like this to disable line numbering. And then I can copy and paste this down here and we'll see the results, whoops. Uh, I will also remove this, uh, this count star. Again, anytime I'm trying to understand what a, uh, a select query is doing, my first tool is to just look at the from clause 
without any of the like fancy things going on in the table and the column selection up here. Uh, so here, count star, that was, there will be, there are 56 rows in here. We'll see why in a second. But I'll start by just doing a select star and seeing what the output down here is gonna look like. Hit enter. And you can see now there are four columns. That's the first thing that we're gonna look at over here. Four columns in the result of this cross join. And these left two columns, the ID and the fruit right here, this corresponds to the columns from basket A. In order to verify that, in my Vim window up here, I'll press G Shift T, take us back to the, uh, oops, I want a GT, take me over to the create tables.sql file over here. And we can see that basket A does in fact have two uh, columns, id and fruit A. And so the uh, id and fruit A over here correspond to these two things from the basket A column, from the basket A table. And the reason basket A is coming first is because in my cross join over here, basket A is to the left of basket B. So the columns of basket A will be to the left of the columns of basket B. These two columns over here, this ID and this fruit B correspond to the columns from basket B. And if we scroll down just a little bit, we can see that inside basket B, there are in fact the ID and the fruit B over here. Um, so the first thing that happens in a cross join is that the number of columns grows and the, the columns just get added together. You sort of concatenate the columns from, from both of the input tables. That's sort of the least interesting part of the cross join though. The more interesting part is how the rows themselves are actually formed. So let's take a look at that next. And up here in the top, I wanna go back to the create tables and I wanna look at the basket B table. And you'll notice if we look at the basket B that we have apple, apple, orange, orange, watermelon, pear, null, null. And looking over in the fruit B column right here, so I'm just comparing the fruit B from basket B right here to the fruit B in the result of my cross join, I also have apple, apple, orange, orange, watermelon, pear, null, null. So the same exact contents right here got duplicated right here in the ID and the fruit B uh, columns. <coughs> Uh, so technically what the cross join is doing is for every row in the left column, every row in the left table, it repeats that row uh, uh, once for each row in the right. So here we have apple, apple, orange, orange, watermelon, pear, null, null, corresponding to all of these right here. So this one apple row uh, got repeated, what was that, seven times, eight times for uh, each of these rows in the basket B table. If we look up at uh, basket A, we can see that the very first row over here is in fact one apple, so that's where this one apple comes from. I'm gonna press the down arrow. Again, I'm in the pager environment in the bottom uh, terminal down here. I'll uh, press the down arrow a little bit so we get to the next row down here. Uh, once again, we had a duplicate row, one apple, another one apple right here gets repeated a bunch of times. And then the, uh, the right hand side is the fruit B basket sort of just appended again uh, with this same row repeated uh, every time once for every results in the right basket. Scrolling down more, we can see now a little bit more interesting. We've changed what the basket A looks like to two orange. So the uh, two orange gets repeated eight times over here, once for each row in basket B. And so on. The, the uh, three banana will get repeated. Three banana will get repeated once for each row. And it doesn't matter. There is no special behavior for null values over here. Everything just gets repeated exactly as it is. And so if I press shift G to take me to the end of the pager environment, we can see that we have this totally null row. Uh, the very last row down here, null, null, gets repeated once for everything over here, uh, resulting in a, the last row being null, 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 null. We get 56 rows down here because uh, basket A, basket A has seven rows and basket B has eight rows. So basket A comma basket B will have seven times eight rows. Anytime you're using the, the cross join on something, the, uh, the total number of rows will be uh, multiplied. That uh, the, the total number of rows in the cross join of these, two, uh, of these two tables is the total number of rows in this one times the total number of rows in this one. 
the name of the cross join, the, the cross part in particular, cross of cross join comes from or is inspired by the cross and a cross product, the cross and cross product. And, and the, the cross join is like the cross product between these two tables. If you've seen the cross product in uh, sets before of just combining everything in the left-hand side with everything in the right-hand side. Uh, any questions about just mechanically, physically what the cross join is? Okay, the cross join by itself is really useful like this. Uh, instead, we usually combine the cross join somehow with a where clause that uh, takes something, has a condition that involves both the left hand um, basket, the left hand table and the right hand table. In this case, this, uh, this equality condition is what we're uh, gonna use. And again, in order to understand what's going on here, I'm going to, uh, well, we'll go ahead and first copy and paste that down here. Again, in order to understand this, I wanna get rid of this count, uh, just do the star. So I'll press the up arrow and move my cursor over to delete this count, just do a select star and hit enter. And now you can see that we're only keeping the rows where the fruit A right here matches the fruit B over here. Um, because of my condition right here. Because of this condition right here, we're only keeping the situations where uh, fruit A is equal to uh, fruit B. Um, as, sorry, where the ID on basket A is equal to the ID on basket B. In the columns up here, we have two ID columns. Uh, the one on the left, though, is from the basket A. This is called a qualified uh, name of this column right here qualified because we're specifically saying that it comes from the basket a table because we have two IDs over here we have to disambiguate which of these IDs we're referring to and uh, so we're saying basket a dot ID equals basket B dot ID in general anytime you have a cross join you'll have to qualify the column names Notice that uh, there are no null IDs down here. There are no all null IDs. Even though we already said that when we just do the cross join by itself, the very last line, for example, has a null in the ID column right here and a null in the ID column right here. And so you might think that we should grab this, grab these results, grab these rows as well, but we do not because this will evaluate to null on the left-hand side for this row. And uh, the right-hand side also will evaluate to null. Uh, but as long as we have one thing that is null on an equals operator, we do not uh, select that row. And so we will never, when we have this cross join with an equals operator like this, we will never grab, um, we will never grab any of the null columns from this ID right here. Any questions so far? Yes, here you go. Ah, uh, yeah. So now that we've added this where clause, the number of rows is no longer the product of the size of these two tables. Um, that uh, just the without the where clause, without the where clause. So if I delete this where clause right here and just do select star from basket A, cross join bas basket B, hit enter. In that case, shift G to go to the end of the pager environment, we have 56 rows. It will be the, uh, the product, but once you, including a where clause to do filtering, you're removing some of those rows, and so you'll no longer uh, get the, the product. You'll get something less than the product. Does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, so, yeah, so up here, uh, let's see. So the, uh, in order to answer uh, this question, in order to explain what this question is, um, what, I, what I need to do is I need to somehow redo this, uh, this command 
but I'm going to have to do a lot of typing in order to, to redo this command, in order to repeat the question and answer it. And I mean, it's possible to do a lot of typing in this terminal environment, but it is really inconvenient. And so what I actually do when I am working is I use the backslash E command in psql. And backslash E, what E stands for is editor. Uh, it's a shortcut that opens up your editor inside of psql with your uh, previous command already loaded into it. So I'll do backslash E like this, and we can see that the previous command got loaded inside Vim right here. And now I can use my Vim editing uh, uh, techniques in order to edit this a little bit more conveniently than just editing it on the command line. And um, let's see, so the, the particular question was that if we change this in order to uh, have basket B on the left-hand side over here and uh, basket A on the right-hand side, why do we get the same uh, results? Uh, now that I've made that change, I'll press uh, colon Q. It doesn't matter whether you uh, save it or not. Oh, I guess we'll do w, WQ, do a save there. And uh, we get the, the same results down here. If I press the up arrow, you can see that uh, the previous command had the B on the left-hand side and the A on the right-hand side. And we get the same results down here. The why do we get the same results? It's the just the fact that the equals operator here is uh, commutative, so it doesn't matter what's on the left hand side, what's on the right hand side. Um, the the baskets up here are um, uh, we still start with the same still start with this same like full cross join table with fifty six elements, and we just select all the rows that happen to match this condition, and this condition will is uh, is uh, equivalent to the the similar condition like this. Uh, was that the, the question that you were actually asking? Okay, great. And, th and that's a, a great way to like be thinking about all of the things that we're going over with SQL going forward is like what are some of the like common mathematical properties about all these operators like associativity and commutativity. And it turns out that uh, for cross joins, the order of the cross join uh, has no effect on the uh, results except for ordering how the columns will be ordered. So previously I did uh, A cross join B. If I change that to B cross join A, the only difference will be the order of my uh, fruit A and fruit B uh, columns up here. Redo that and now you can see that fruit B is on the left hand side and fruit A is on the right hand side. And so this null value that corresponded to fruit A is now just on the right-hand side over here, but otherwise the results are the same. So I'll rerun this command again now with basket A on the left again, basket B on the right, compare the outputs, um, and the outputs are exactly the same. Uh, we say up to ordering of the columns. So uh, we say that the cross join is commutative, up to ordering of columns or modulo ordering of columns. Um, great questions. Any other? Yes. Uh, great question. The question is on the quizzes, would the ordering of columns be important? And the answer is um, I don't care about the ordering of the columns. That would be fine. Um, the quiz problems. Uh, so the reason, one of the reasons why I have, for example, a count star up here on the uh, these sort of example quiz problems is just to make the output of the problem much easier for you to write out. That if you understand what uh, the count star output is, in order to understand the count star output, you have to understand the output without the count star, the full table. Uh, but generally, the quiz problems involve a count star right here, so that you only have to figure out, okay how many uh, results are there actually going to be, and uh, then things like ordering of columns is not going to be important there. Um, so that's why you'll see a lot of, you'll basically every problem on the quiz is gonna have an aggregate function probably inside of it. Um, great questions. On the quiz, you can expect to see lots of weird uh, conditions down here in the where clause. Uh, for your homework assignments, the, uh, 
at least on the first and the second homework assignments, there are no problems where you have to use a cross join with a weird condition down here. Instead, the reason we care about the cross join is because it's going to allow us to explain how the other types of joins are working. And on your uh, first homework assignment, the first Postgres uh, SQL assignment that's due today, there were a number of times where you were supposed to use the inner join. And so now we will actually talk about like mechanically what actually is an inner join. And the answer is that an inner join is just syntactic sugar for a cross join plus a where clause. So up here, I have this, uh, this command right here. I'm gonna use, use my backslash E to re-enter uh, uh, Vim. And I'm going to rewrite an equivalent command right here, select count star from basket A, inner join, or just join for short. Uh, anytime you see join by itself, it means that it's an inner join. So basket A, join basket B. And then the on clause and uh, uh, comparing uh, inside of the on clause is what is inside of the where condition up here. So on and then uh, I'll do y dollar sign yank dollar sign to copy that into my buffer dollar sign right here tend me to the end of the line p to paste all of that. And these two commands right here are exactly uh, exactly the same as each other. The again the inner join the inner join is syntactic sugar for a cross join plus a where clause, where the where clause down here is just copied from the on over here. So the mechanical way to understand about what's going on from the with an inner join is to convert it back into a cross join and uh, understand the original problem like this. I'll comment out this so we can rerun this, colon WQ, and we see that we get the same uh, the same result here with this output that gave us a five as my original output right here also gives us a five. That the inner join is just sy syntactic sugar for the cross join. Uh, there's a couple of more uh, problems down here, uh, but uh, and, I, and for each one of them, I list here's the syntax using the join and here's the syntax that it desugars to with the, uh, the cross join instead of the inner join. Any questions on the inner join syntax right here, what's going on? Oh. Is the, is the on similar to the user problem? Yeah, so, so great question. The question is that on when we were going over the homework assignment last week, I recommended using the using clause instead of the on clause. Um, uh, and the question is, how does that compare? And the answer is that uh, if I scroll down a little bit more to right here, uh, we have an explanation right here about the using clause, which says the using clause is syntactic sugar for an inner join that meets two conditions. The first is that there's an equality uh, uh, but, uh, condition in the, oin, in the on clause. So here we have an equality in our where right here, basket.id equals basket.b.id. So the first condition is that we have an equals. And the second condition is that we have an identical column name in both tables. And in this case, we do have an identical column name, ID and ID like this. So we can uh, use syntactic sugar, not just to use an inner join, but to use an inner join with the using clause. I'll do backslash E to get back into my uh, Vim environment, make this back into an inner join right here, delete, press DD right here to delete that line, shift A to send me to the end of the line in insert mode over here, and then I'll type using and then in parentheses ID like this. And this is gonna be once again, the exact same result as my uh, previous commands. Uh, using the using clause over here. You can think about the using as desugaring first to the on clause, and then the on with the join desugaring to the cross join. In general, there's never a situation where you have to use the using clause or where you have to use an inner join. Um, but if it's possible to use these clauses, it's much nicer to use them, much easier to understand what's going on. And so it's good practice, just on its own line, good practice to use 
inner joins instead of cross joins when possible and good practice to use using instead of on when possible. I noticed a lot of people uh, in, your, in your homeworks are using uh, the, the on clause instead of the using clause to join tables together. And it's acceptable, it's acceptable in homeworks to use on instead of using. Um, but the, uh, the resulting code is much, much harder to read. And uh, so I would encourage you to get into the habit of using these uh, syntactic sugars that are easier to read. It makes it easier for you to figure out what's going on, which tables you're joining together and why, and uh, makes it easier if you're showing your code to somebody else for them to follow along with what you're trying to do. Uh, my only, I guess, caveat warning here is just uh, make sure that you're understanding how these null values are relating to things like the using clause. The reason why the using clause up here is not matching the null values is because, again, this desugars into an equals, and equals ignores the null values. Any questions about anything so far? Yes. Yeah, it's a good question. So the question is here, where exactly is this, uh, uh, this ID coming from when we're combining not just with two tables, but with multiple tables? And uh, we're going to uh, hold on to that. I think the very last thing in this notes one file is with uh, multiple tables, not just two tables being joined together. So let's see if there's anything else before we get to that. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, so we'll talk about the, the natural join first, and then I'll answer that question. Uh, okay, so another type of join, this natural join, is uh, another syntactic sugar for uh, the using clause. So in this case, I'll press the uh, uh, up arrow, up arrow, get back to my uh, select count star up here. From basket A, join basket B using ID. Hit enter. We got five right there. I'll type backslash E to open my editor. An even maybe simpler way of uh, writing this is the natural join, and then you don't need to specify any columns at all. The natural join will use uh, whatever columns these two tables have in common with each other to join those together. Colon save and quit that. Uh -oh. um, and I have a syntax error here because I don't know how to spell natural. I took to nat to all. Shift F, capital T, to take my cursor backwards. Uh, that F in the letter is how you can navigate inside of a line really quickly. If I type F semicolon, it takes me to the next semicolon to the right. If I type uh, Shift F, again, the mnemonic in Vim is that capital things take you to the left, lowercase things take you to the right. So Shift F and then Shift T will find the T going to the left, the next T going to the left. That takes me to that T over there, A to enter enter mode. Uh, to the right one character and type R right here. Uh, there we go. Natural like that. Escape colon WQ. Hit enter. And now it is the fact, the same result. So the natural join is one more level of syntactic sugar on top of the using clause. The using clause, using clause, very widely used. Uh, the natural join, very common uh, uh, commonly avoided not widely used commonly avoided not widely used um, the reason for that is that it's very easy to write uh, joins that are not doing what you want them to do joining on incorrect columns with the natural join and uh, uh, so most people uh, most style guides for SQL recommend using the using clause and avoiding the natural join the natural join, for various reasons, is considered uh, a wart in the SQL language or a uh, code smell and something to be avoided. Um, but you will have to see it uh, or know what to do with it on your quizzes. Any questions about the natural join? Yes. So is it useful? 
Uh, yeah, so the question is, how do these compare to set operations? When we get to the, what are called outer joins, um, we'll start making more comparisons to set operations. Um, and there's a lot of intuition that can be gun, uh, gotten that way, but again, that intuition will, will break in certain cases. Uh, and uh, so you'll need to fall back on these like actual definitions. That there will be edge cases where the set operation analogies won't work. Okay. Another topic down here is this idea of a self join. Um, a, there's no special syntax for a self join, so that's not its own special join type, but you will hear people use the phrase self join very often. And any type of join, so we've seen cross, internatural as examples of types of joins so far. Any of those types can also be a self-join. What makes something a self-join is when you join a table with itself. Uh, so let's scroll down a little bit and see syntactically what's, what that looks like. Here I am doing a cross-join from basket A, cross-joined onto basket A. I know it's a cross-join because I have a comma right here. And anytime you have a self-join, I know this is a self-join because the table name right here is basket A in both cases. Anytime I have a uh, self-join or anytime I have a table that appears multiple times, I always have to provide a name for that table so that I can uh, reference it in multiple, multiple locations. So the standard way in SQL, anytime you're trying to name something is with the as keyword. And so basket A, the first one as A1, uh, cross-join basket A as A2. Two. And then down here, when I do a1.id, this fully qualified name right here says this is the ID from the A1 table. So this will be the ID from the leftmost columns right here. And this will be the ID from the rightmost columns uh, down here. Uh, self joins are, they can be tricky to wrap your head around, uh, uh, but they can make a lot of code much more concise in your uh, uh, this upcoming week's homework. There are, will be a lot of opportunities to use self-joins if you would like to, even though it will never be required to. There will always be an alternative that uh, will not require a self-join. Um, but there are some situations where the self-join will be just like two or three lines of code, and the longer alternative will be like 10 or 20 lines of code. In two weeks, your next homework assignment after this week's, there will be situations where you'll have to use the self-join, and we'll be talking a lot more about those uh, types of situations. But at this point, the mechanics of the self-join is just it's when you have two tables that are joined together through any type of join clause, and they behave it behaves exactly the same way as it would if this was a different table that just had the same values inside of it. So here, there's a, ver a relatively complicated uh, join operation going on right here. Uh, the way to understand this, again, start with the select star from basket A as A1, comma, basket A as A2. And uh, without any sort of column selection going on over here, without any sort of where clause, uh, hit enter right here. And we can understand just what is the structure of this table. And then uh, we can apply this A1.id greater than A2.id. Uh, filtering out these rows. So my prediction would be, for example, these two rows would not be included in that because those two rows are uh, equal to each other. Similarly, uh, none of these rows right here will be included because here we have the A2, the right-hand side, being greater than the one on the left-hand side. Um, so if we do a where A1 dot it greater than A2 dot it like that, then here was the, uh, the final results of, of that. And then the final... Uh, final task is to apply the count star up here. There will be problems on your quiz on Thursday that have these sort of complicated uh, non-equal sign uh, where conditions over here. And so you'll have to make sure that you have in your head some sort of procedure for uh, uh, how you're going to step through those and filter those out. Okay, so that's the, the self-joins. Um, the as keyword is optional. That's another sort of SQL oddity that anytime there is the as keyword, you can always just delete it. Uh, and so if you have a column name or a table name, 
Uh, you, if you just have some other identifier afterwards, that becomes the new name of the thing on the left. That's your shortcut name for it, your alias for it. Uh, so that is syntactically totally okay as well. Whether you have the as or not has the as doesn't matter. And you can see here lots of examples of using the self-join with uh, all the different types of join operators that we've seen so far. Any questions about self-joins? Now the question is, why do they have different content? The, um, the A1 table over here, why does it have different content than the, like the ID and the fruit over here when it's both the same table? Shouldn't it have the same content? And the answer is it has different content because for each row in the table over here, we duplicate that over here. So when I run this, um, here is the first row of my, uh, of my basket A table, the one apples, this is the first row. And for each one of these, I replace it with a, uh, all of the, or I add all of the values over here. Um, so it, it is confusing because these have the same name. So it seems like they should have the same contents everywhere. Um, but you could imagine like, uh, that this, this could be named something totally different, like basket C, that just happens to have the same contents as basket A, and 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 then it would maybe be less confusing. Uh, but yeah, going back to the definition of that, it's the cross product. Think about it as the cross product between this thing on the left and this thing on the right. And so, for every row in your left table, you will add every row in the right table. Then go on to the next line, the second row in the left table, add everything in the right table. Um, yeah. Good question. There's another good aside that, uh, or another good chance to remind you all that there is, uh, for all of these uh, concepts, if you want more like written explanations or somebody else's explanations about things, this postgrestutorial.com website uh, has good written explanations about all of the things that, you're, that are required for your quiz. And actually, the, uh, the tables that we're using for your quiz come from this postgrestutorial.com website. So a lot of their examples are things that um, uh, will help you directly with quiz problems. And again, for the first quiz uh, on Thursday, it's sections one through four that uh, you're responsible for. OK, last thing in this uh, quiz notes one right here is um, this section about binary operations uh, that joins are, in fact, binary operations. And so they always involve exactly two tables. Uh, but you can combine multiple joins together. And uh, these cross joins, inner joins, natural joins are all associative and commutative, again, up to the ordering of the tables. So things like uh, this query right here, I'll go ahead and copy and paste this down here and hit enter. This is a, it has a count star inside of it, so we're not seeing the column names up here. But if I reorder anything inside of uh, these tables right here, we're guaranteed to get the exact same results. So backslash E, uh, go ahead and select that and copy it over, say to right here, and uh, we get the exact same results that the order of, uh, as long as you're not mixing join types, the order of cross joins, inner joins, natural joins, um, associative and uh, commutative. Uh, so there's a couple of examples here. Uh, there was a question, uh, about the using clause a while back. And if you have multiple tables, where does the using actually like get the, uh, uh, get the column names from? And does it get it just from this uh, table directly up here or, or, or how does that work? I'm going to add a, a new, uh, I'm, I'm pausing here because I think I actually I still want to I still don't want to address that yet. That makes more sense to address in the the notes too when we talk about the different joint types. So um, 
yeah, we'll hold on to that question. Last thing, very last thing to say about this quote, notes quiz one here, this note at the very end, uh, that there is this type of algebra uh, called relational algebra. Um, and relational algebra is like the linear algebra of discrete data. Um, and SQL is directly inspired by this, uh, this relational algebra. And uh, so if this were like a databases theory course, then one of the things that those courses tend to do is they tend to introduce this like mathematical abstraction called relational algebra, show how uh, these SQL queries map onto relational algebra, and then they make you prove things about like associativity and commutativity of different uh, uh, operators. Uh, since this is more of a data science oriented course, more oriented on applications, we're skipping over this whole like re relational algebra concept and uh, just sticking entirely inside of the SQL. Uh, that's it for the quiz notes one here and everything that you will need for Thursday. Any questions about anything? Yes. Yes. I will print out this create tables.sql file. So you will have the original create table commands up here and the insert into uh, uh, commands. So you'll have both the schema and the, the values. Uh, it'll, it'll literally just be a printout of this, uh, this file right here. And so you'll get one printout like that and then one printout that will look like example one.sql just with different, um, different problems. Paste it in. Exact same tables. Yeah, there will not be any change in the uh, the schema or the values of the of the the data. Good question. Any other questions about anything that we have talked about today? Yes, Avijay. Um, we can talk about that after class. Yeah, good question. Oliver. So in the query after the, that you mentioned the associative part, yep. um, is that a cross join with these different? Uh, do, do, do. So, yeah. Here on line 281, yes, this would be a, a cross join with three different tables. Technically, what's going on here is that we're first cross joining uh, basket A, A1 and basket A, A2 like this. And then the result of that is being cross joined with basket B. Uh, but because it's associative and commutative, it doesn't matter how you draw these. Um, these parentheses, if it was more convenient for some reason to uh, understand the query by joining uh, this, these two things together on the right first and then joining on the left, then that would be a uh, perfectly fine thing to do and you'll get the same results. Uh, so yeah, here we have, so the question is if we take off that, uh, um, uh, that that count operator, then how many rows uh, are we going to have? Um, we'd have to take off the where operator to, to get all of the rows. And I think A1 has seven, uh, A2 has seven, B has eight. So seven times seven times eight, whatever that is, is what we should get. Okay, good questions. I want us to start on the, uh, the quiz notes too, um, just so that we can get a sense of what's gonna be different coming up for us in uh, our next week's material compared to uh, the first week's material. And so I've just, uh, inside of Vim here, opened up the quiz notes 2sql file. Again, this will not be on the quiz on Thursday, but uh, it is one of the files that I had as a handout for you up here. And the main thing that this is introducing is this idea of a subquery. And a subquery is when you have a select statement inside of another select statement. So something like this, I have this uh, 
uh, this select statement right here, select ID from basket A. And I, if I wanted to count how many rows were in this, uh, uh, this, this table right here, I could in this simple case just add a count operator to the ID like this and get that the answer is five. But we'll see that there are more complicated cases where you can't just uh, modify this right here. And you have to have an outer query that instead of having a named table right here, you replace it with a, a, a query that generates a table. So here, the from clause, you don't have to have a table that was created from the create table command. You can have a table that was created from the select command, that this is the output of the uh, select command, the output. Uh, this table right here will be uh, the input to this from clause and the thing that we will count over. The uh, main motivation for why this is going to be needed is we're going to uh, introduce these things called outer joins. And outer joins are defined in terms of these uh, subqueries like this. And so if you've uh, seen left, right joins before, those are examples of outer joins. And their definitions are, uh, require us to use subqueries like this. Your next homework assignment, which uh, has been posted, uh, uh, has a number of problems where you have to have to use these these subqueries. And Thursday after the quiz, we'll go over how to do that. This is a good stopping point for us for today, though. So we'll end a little bit early. And if people do have more questions about uh, quiz material, I'll stick around and uh, get those questions answered for you.